My brother-in-law, Leonard, died by suicide on September 20th, 2016. And on December 17th, 2016, my husband, Lindsay, also died by suicide after a very lengthy battle with clinical depression and bipolar disorder. And it was a very trying, difficult time. But I felt that at this point in time, my voice needed to be heard. As a first responder um, today, this past five, 10 years, probably 30 to 40% of what we respond to is directly related to mental health. Our area has been you know, uh, inundated with uh, mental health crises, and uh, it's not just the suicides. It's every second day, it seems like we're taking somebody somewhere picking up somebody in their home for a mental health related issue. The number of mental health calls we have certainly impacts our ambulance crew uh, and crews, especially when it's uh, we're from a small tight knit community and we know a lot of the families, we know a lot of the people that we're responding to. So the connection there is emotional uh, for us. And um, you know, when you're actually dealing with your, your, your partner's family, loved one, your own family, loved one, it, it is taking a toll on us. Uh, there had been a sense of the urgency in our community created um, and our service, our mental health and addiction service had become very crisis driven. We had, were losing uh, people in the community at an unprecedented rate. Over a 16 month period we had lost 14 people to suicide in several of our small close-knit communities. The communities were trying to come to terms with these tragedies and asking why this was happening on the Bjorn Peninsula. And as frontline providers and clinicians, we were feeling the impact of feeling overwhelmed, stressed, um, feeling like we weren't doing enough for the community uh, to help prevent these suicides from occurring. Grand Bank, who only has a population of 2,000 people, they had lost four individuals. So we knew we had a problem. We knew we had a serious problem. So the mayor, Mayor Rex Matthews, uh, called CEO, Mr. Diamond of, of Eastern Health. And in no time, uh, Mr. Mr. Diamond had staff, senior staff and, and vice president out to meet with, uh, with Mayor Matthews and discuss the concerns and the problems. Now, at the same time, Eastern Health was entering into some community consultations around primary health care. So Eastern Health had already started thinking about working differently. So we went to four communities, four areas uh, on the Bjorn Peninsula, and we asked people about health and what was important to them. And in each of those consultations, mental health and addictions came out in the top three priorities of health on the Bjorn Peninsula. And the public very loudly said, we need change, we can't access the service, something needs to happen. We knew something had to change. There was so much pain and trauma uh, and loss in this community. We had a lot of suicides, we had a lot of long waits for services, and we had people who had lost family members, who had lost co-workers, who had lost neighbors, and we heard that, that pain and that cry, and we knew that we needed to come together and start to find some solutions to improve how we support uh, mental health and wellness uh, from a a primary health care lens and a, and a general health wellness lens uh, here on the Bjorn Peninsula. So we wanted to ensure that we had a broad representation of both health and community and really, really to look at building a true partnership on how do we improve mental health and wellness uh, on the Bjorn Peninsula. I said I want to be involved. I want to make a change. I want my husband's death not to be in vain, and I want him to have a voice that he could never have in his own lifetime. In our old way of doing things, I think we were very system-centered and not client-centered. We were doing a lot of um, unnecessary paperwork that wasn't meeting the needs of the client, but was meeting the needs of the system. I think the biggest difference in the approach to change this time was that the ideas about what the change would be, how it would happen, what the goal was and what was needed came directly from the people involved. So people in the community, service providers such as myself, got a chance to speak out and say what we thought was needed and how that would look. Instead of the ideas coming from top down, it actually came bottom up. We heard frustration, we heard loss, 
uh, we heard a little bit of anger. But what happened was that we actually listened. And it's only in listening that the change can really start to happen. The management staff got together with their uh, hands-on people here on the Buren Peninsula and decided that there needs to be changes the way we deal with mental health and addictions on the Buren Peninsula. And what happened is that the staff jumped at that opportunity to make the changes. From that, it's all for us, it's been all positive, to be honest with you, all positive. The community can challenge some of our perceptions, some of our fears, some of our resistance, and we're able to then start co-creating something uh, in a different way. So you work together, and the first team that solves the puzzle wins a prize. We really need to provide opportunities for people to safely um, consider alternate ways of thinking or viewing the world. So sometimes that happens through conversation between community or health and their different perspectives. Other times we can use different activities, um, different learning opportunities, different games that help people to start considering maybe there's another way that I can view the world. Maybe there's another way that I can understand understand my work and then they're able to take that knowledge and attach it to their clinical or real life experiences. We thought outside the box and we were like maybe they got pieces over there that we need but without thinking that we would just stay here and said well that's it we don't have another piece we can't we can't solve this puzzle. We sometimes don't get the opportunity to do what Diane explained to us to sit back look out around us and say, okay, I'm having trouble here, I'm struggling. Where can I look for that solution? We were a part of the process that got us to this point. We were very much involved in the problem solving that got us here. And we were encouraged to think outside the box. And we actually took it a step further and we got rid of that box. And we created a brand new, service that I feel is the Cadillac service of mental health and addictions. Well, the solution was we needed to deliver service when the client wanted it. When they realized themselves that they required a service, we had to be there. We had to be ready to deliver it. And so we as a group, stakeholder group, as a service, had to look at our processes and remove some of the busy things that at the end of the day wasn't helpful to the client, which is what we did uh, when we opened our doors and said, you can walk in at any time that you need a service. The main thing that changed was how we were delivering our service. We went from a referral and appointment and waitlist model to a walk-in model with no wait list, no wait time, and client-centered service where we are meeting the needs of the client exactly when they need us. Hi, nice to see you, come on in. I'm glad you came back. I think the importance of being able to offer this service to the students here at John Burke um, through a walk-in clinic is important because early intervention helps those children develop positive coping skills, a positive self-esteem. It helps them learn tools and tips that they can use throughout their life. So the earlier you intervene, the more positive that outlook becomes. Thankfully, uh, this past year now, things have quietened down a lot and uh, we're hopefully we're over that hump and uh, you know our mental health is starting to stabilize here in this area. When I started first, most of the mental health patients we dealt with were during interfacility transfers, but now it seems like patients are more willing to call for an ambulance when they're in their crises or in their time of need at their home or wherever they may be, right? So we're responding to those emergency calls as well as you know the physical and trauma calls, right? So you know it's great that the barriers are being broken, the stigma is being you know reduced. A long ways to go yet, but we're getting there. Uh, for us as paramedics, we've uh, certainly seen a big, uh, a big uh, increase in the amount of help that we can get. Um, I think the awareness alone uh, has certainly helped us tremendously. Uh, the nursing staff at the Dr. Respecta Health Center, uh, you know, they certainly recognize when we have a difficult call and they got no problem calling us aside and saying, you know, Derek, do you need to have a little chat or whatever. We now have a full-time mental health nurse at the health center here in Grand Bank and uh, she's always just a phone call away or whatever and that's certainly great. That's the, that's the important thing is that 
it doesn't always have to be the same method that we all use, but that we all got a way to mm -hmm. decompress or de-stress or find relaxation and peace yes. in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Amongst the things that we do find stressful. I like seeing that people now are more willingly open to talk about their mental health. They come to our facilities and our physicians now can ask them about their physical health as to why they came. But they'll also say, how's your mental health today? And now our patients will actually respond. They won't hide the mental health and keep that stigma there. They'll actually let it go and actually discuss openly how they're feeling mentally. Let's just stop what we're doing for a second and repeat after me, okay? <clears throat> I am enough. I am lovable. I am lovable. I am safe. I am safe. I am powerful. I am powerful. I am powerful. I am powerful. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am healthy. I am healthy. I am peaceful. I am peaceful. I am healthy. Having mental health illness clinic here. Uh, made it a lot easier to do uh, have consultations earlier to uh, improve the patient's outcome. Uh, the patient outcome you cannot imagine have improved a lot and they do have nice programs to deal with the patients to improve their uh, like they provide them a, a, a chance to speak to uh, people who, uh, from the same uh, illnesses they share experiences together and uh, um, you cannot imagine how much uh, improvement ha ha have been made. The level of change that was possible and realised here in the Buren Peninsula is possible in all of our communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and those teams and communities deserve the same level of support and facilitation that this community had. Uh, so we need to ensure that we have people trained and ready to go out and support uh, these communities and these individuals and healthcare providers in really making um, a difference in primary health care and mental health and addictions in our province. Totally positive, totally positive. I mean, the, the, the difference is, is, uh, is unbelievable, really, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, I mean is, is, uh, is it all over? I mean, is, is we got to fix all? No, no. But uh, the, uh, where we've gone from 2016 to 2019, it's fantastic really, and we're very, very pleased. I mean, this was a change that was uh, spearheaded by community. Uh, it was come up, you know, the community came up with the solution and the community is still sustaining it uh, in working with us in Eastern Health to keep, you know, everything going. Uh, it is absolutely exciting for sure. and something we can hang our hat on to say, it started here.